Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So the topic of today's lecture is uh, volume one of Vajis Manual, uh, second edition of Vajis Manual. And this includes uh, the group Archaea. So basically we discuss that how Archaea, they differ from new bacteria and how they are different from uh, the eukaryotes. So this group is uh, something different from the other two groups. And uh, there are a number of ways in which uh, they differ from bacteria and eukaryotes. And this difference uh, not only includes uh, their cell wall, rather it's chemistry, it's membrane, lipid structure, molecular biology and metabolism. So and there are, there are uh, many differences among these groups. So they have a, a very uh, different or a special structural and chemical and metabolic adaptations. And uh, this group, because of this, these adaptations, it's uh, able to they are able to grow in the extreme environments because of these uh, adaptations. So they are best known uh, for growing in some restricted habitats or those habitats which are not normally um, inhabited by the usual um, bacterial strains or the moles. So these includes um, those areas which have much higher temperatures and uh, which, uh, where salinity is um, super exceeding I must say uh, they are said to be hypersaline so basically and this is the um, uh, one of the prominent uh, this is one of the prominent feature of archaea that they tend to survive in such harsh environments because of the difference that lies in their uh, structure chemistry and membrane lipids and metabolism so basically and you can uh, you can divide archaea into uh, two phylums because uh, in the current edition uh, of Burgess manual and there are two phyla uh, with uh, several orders and uh, we'll discuss uh, these two and they include green archaeota, green archaeota and then uri archaeota. So these are the two important uh, phyla basically. So as far as uh, their cell wall structure is concerned, and we basically divide bacteria, you bacteria into two main categories, gram positive and gram negative. But these archaea bacteria, some of them, they are gram positive, some of them, they are gram negative. So it depends on their cell wall structure. But you cannot define them with one of that staining uh, reaction. Secondly, uh, if we talk about uh, the uh, shapes, so they may be pleomorphic, uh, they may be spherical. You can find almost all the shapes uh, within this uh, archaeal group. And it could be rod shape or cuboidal, triangular, plate shape, irregular shape. So there is so much variation regarding the shapes. Plus, uh, colonization is uh, also observed in few uh, strains and some are some are existing as single cells but a majority of them they they form filaments or they form um, aggregates and uh, and their multiplication is uh, maybe through binary fusion some multiply through budding some multiply through fragmentation so a lot of variety and different mechanisms uh, is present within archaea so archaea is uh, quite diverse uh, physiologically and uh, um, as far as their respiratory um, 
mechanisms are concerned they could be again aerobic they could be facultative anaerobic and they could be strictly anaerobic and nutritionally uh, some are autotrophs some are heterotrophs and some are organotrophs by temperature requirements uh, again a number of uh, different groups including psychophiles mesophiles hyper thermophiles uh, they they are all the part of this group or the domain archaea okay as far as their ecology is concerned and so they are i just told you that they are mostly from those environments which are known as the extreme environments and they are mostly extreme environments have those environments basically which have uh, much more stresses like um, sometimes in the stress may be higher or lower temperature it may be ph it may be concentrated salt sometimes absence of oxygen right so they are all termed as extreme environments they can also be found in human body in the gut or in the digestive tracts of the human and or the animals they can also found in soil or in the ocean surfaces and in the, some of the archaea and they have the tendency to produce pigments and they produce pigment in uh, that much quantity that the entire uh, area is basically uh, stained with that archaeal pigment right like i give example that in some hypersaline environments population becomes so dense that the brine brine means that saline is um, uh, becomes the color of the saline becomes red with the archaeal pigments and then moving to was uh, archaeal cell walls and membranes so archaea uh, as we uh, discussed that uh, they can be stained either gram positive or gram negative uh, and they do not have uh, a true peptidoglycan because uh, a true peptidoglycan uh, contains muramic uh, acid and uh, d amino acids but uh, archaeal cell walls they do not have uh, uh, the muramic acid or the d amino acids that make up the peptidoglycan rather some of the archaeal strains they have uh, peptidoglycan like polymer which is also known as pseudomurine and which is uh, cross linked with uh, l amino acids instead of d amino acids uh, secondly uh, and there some of the members of archaea they have a cell wall made up of uh, polysaccharides which is similar to chondritin sulfate it's a it's a polysaccharide uh, which is present in the animal connective tissue to so similar type of uh, polysaccharides uh, they are present in some of the members and some have protein walls again archaea they are very diverse in their cell wall chemistry as well and uh, one of uh, the distinctive archaeal feature is the membrane lipids because um, these are the uh, structures in which archaea they differ totally from the eukaryotes and the eubacteria so membrane structure is basically uh, it's a universal structure but uh, archaea they differ in the membrane lipids because in other two domains like eukaryotes and eu bacteria uh, the membrane lipids they are comprised of uh, fatty acids and glycerols which are linked with the ester linkage but in this case archaea they are not linked with the ester linkage rather they are linked with the ether linkage and this ether linkage is basically and the linkage that stabilizes the membrane and that's how they are able to survive in such extreme environments 
uh, right now I'm talking about the group property or the domain uh, uh, properties that are shared by many members of uh, the RIT. Right now, moving to us is uh, genetics and the molecular biology. So sometimes uh, the archaea on the genomes of archaea mostly and they are uh, very smaller uh, and uh, comparative to the bacterial genome and again there is a lot of variety in the gc content because in this domain you can found uh, you can find organism that have uh, about a range of 21 to 58 percent of uh, the gc content so it's very really diverse in this GC content aspect too. And archaea generally have a few plasmids. And uh, it is said that 30% uh, of the genes, they are shared between the archaea and eukaryotes. And um, these proteins, they are uh, involved basically in some of the key functions uh, like transcription, translation, and DNA metabolism. And uh, it is also reported that the uh, micro, microbial strains from the main archaea can, can transfer the genetic information through horizontal gene transfer between uh, thermophilic bacteria and archaea. So um, archaea, they, they share some properties with bacteria, some properties with eukaryotes, but they also have some of the key differential features. That's why this group is uh, remain separated from the other two. As far as we, in, we are discussing about archaeal taxonomy, because we are discussing the course uh, microbial taxonomy. So archaeal taxonomy is important in this regard. So if you're talking about uh, taxonomy, so we have already discussed that uh, you can divide the organisms on two uh, major bases. Uh, one of that are the phenotypic characters, or that this includes so many other subtypes and uh, uh, phylogenetic characters. So phenotypically, or you can say on the basis of physiological and morphological differences, uh, the group archaea or the domain archaea can be uh, generalized or it can be um, generally classified into five different groups. And all of the members can be incorporated in any of the five groups depending on their characters. But phylogenetically, uh, you can divide them into two further phylums we have discussed in previous slides, Uriarchaeota and Cranarchaeota. So these groups include methanogenic archaea, sulfate reducers, extremely halophilic archaea, cell wall less archaea, and extremely thermophilic uh, therm uh, sulfur metabolizers. So we also have some of the representative genera Methanobacterium, Methanococcus, Methanosarcina, Methanomicrobium. Okay. So we'll discuss these groups in the uh, later slides. So moving from here. So since I told you that phylogenetically you can divide them into um, two basic phylums, and uh, these phylums include phylum Phrenarchaeota and uh, Yuri Archaeota. So they are extremely thermophilic. Uh, extremely thermophilic. You can have uh, uh, the idea of their thermophilicity uh, by looking at this picture. And that uh, there are two strains. And these strains, they were inoculated into these tubes and then the tubes were kept under autoclave and after autoclave, the growth was checked and uh, these uh, strains were capable of uh, converting uh, iron into uh, a magnetite. So basically, uh, this can be attracted by a magnet. So... As you can see, there are two species. One is uh, one is from the phylum Prinarchuta, member of the phylum Prinarchuta, and the other one is uh, not from the same. I'll put you some other 
uh, any other species taken as control. So as you can see that once the magnet is kept outside the tube, so because of that magnetite generated by the microbial strain inside the tube, uh, all the uh, magnetic, all the magnetic uh, particles they are attracted to the uh, magnet kept outside, right? But rather in, but in this uh, tube, what happens? Nothing such happened because definitely the cells were killed by uh, the autoclaving temperatures. Right, so that's why they are called extremely thermophilic. So as you, I think you should all know that what is the temperature of autoclave? It's it's around 121 degrees centigrade. So if someone can survive even at that uh, temperature and grow there, so definitely they can be categorized into extremely thermophilic uh, strains, RTL strains. Uh, and um, uh, second thing is. Uh, they mostly depend on sulfur for their growth and they are acidophiles and they are strict anaerobes. And uh, whenever they grow, uh, they grow in those soils which are thermo. Thermologically, they are very uh, high, or you can say they are heated soil, geothermal heated soil and water. And that water, that should be rich in sulfur because they need uh, sulfur for their growth. And uh, when, when, once, they, uh, once they assimilate sulfur, they generate H2SO4. And uh, that's why uh, H2SO4, presence of H2SO4 makes them uh, very much uh, acido makes the environment and the habitat uh, very much acidophilic, right? So acidic. So these habitats, uh, they are mostly called as, which are rich in sulfur and um, which are mostly uh, geothermally uh, heated. So they are mostly called as sulfatra. And uh, at present, there are 25 genera in this uh, phylum, but uh, we'll discuss the two important uh, uh, genera in that includes uh, thermopoteus and sulfonobus. So basically, these uh, these um, are these strains. They were first uh, discovered, and they are mostly discovered uh, from a Yellowstone National Park in New York. So it's one of the famous park, in which is known for the presence of these archaic strains, and it contains so many. Uh, water springs rich in sulfur and thermal geysers. So you can see that this includes uh, pictures from the, uh, this is A and this is actually the pump geyser uh, from Yellow Stone National Park. And uh, it's, it's continuously it contains some yellow pigments which are quite visible and these pigments are basically giving you the presence of the archaeal strains. This, this area is quite much hot or the temperature is so much high that only thermophilic archaea are able to survive in this environment. Second thing is again uh, the Yellowstone National Park and uh, it is it, showing a sulfur cauldron and the water is at uh, boiling temperature and it's very rich in sulfur. So you can isolate uh, sulfolobus strains very well in these habitats. So basically, um, since uh, we'll discuss two well categorized genera, and that includes uh, thermoproteas and sulfolobus. So we'll discuss these two. So basically, sulfolobus strains, they are gram negative and they are aerobic and sulfolobus as it indicates name indicate that uh, it assimilates sulfur and lobus it indicates a spherical shape with lobe uh, with lobes and it has a temperature optima 
about 70 to 80 degrees centigrade and it can have a pH optimum of 2 to 3 where they optimally grow. So they are also known as thermoacidophiles. Means those organisms that optimally grow at higher temperatures and lower pH. Its wall contains lipoproteins and carbohydrates and they grow on sulfur granules and they generate uh, asulfuric acid while oxidizing the sulfur. So definitely because of this reason, uh, the pH becomes too low and they grow optimally at that pH. That's why they are called as thermo. Acidophiles. Another well categorized genera is the uh, thermoproteus, and uh, this is somehow or differentiated from sulfolobus because sulfolobus is uh, a spherical organism, but thermoproteus is a uh, rod uh, like uh, structure. It's a long structure, it could be branched or it could be bent. And uh, its wall is different. It's composed of glycoprotein and it's a strict anaerobe. Rather, sulfolobus is aerobic and thermoproteus is strict anaerobe. So, you can find them in those areas uh, which are deeper and which are which lack uh, oxygen, which are devoid of oxygen. So, it's again, uh, it's hyper thermophilic. And it, it pH range is wide, competitive to the sulfolobus. So, uh, interestingly, it uses carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide as a sole carbon source. And it definitely, it's, it is also found in hot springs or deeper sides of the hot springs, uh, which are rich in sulfur. So, here comes some pictures. As you can see, this is a lobular. Uh, this is the lobular structure of the sulfolobus. It, it, it is showing the thin section, and this uh, is showing the uh, sulfolobus colonies. Uh, a scanning picture of sulfolobus colonies, and these colonies are on some solid substrates, right? And this is showing uh, electron micrograph of uh, thermoproteus, which is a long or rod-like structure. Now moving towards uh, moving towards uh, one thing I would like to mention that you can notice you can notice the structure of the wall or the wall of uh, uh, wall difference uh, the wall of uh, thermoteus is made up of glycoprotein and it's quite intact as you can see that the wall that is made up of uh, Carbohydrates and protein is quite uh, amorphous type of wall. It's not that solid wall. It's not a well-defined cell wall. Then we have phylum Uriarchaeota. The phylum Uriarchaeota it contains again five major groups and those, these are those groups which we have discussed earlier that these are the methanogens or they are the halophiles uh, halobacteria they are thermoplasmas they are extremely thermophilic sulfur metabolizers or they may be sulfur reducers so first we will discuss the methanogenic archaea Methanogenic archaea definitely they are the strict anaerobes. Uh, so they are methanogenic because they can generate methane, and uh, the mechanism is such that that they obtain energy through the synthesis of methane. And it is one of the largest group of archaea. There are so many uh, methanogenic organisms, and they are strict anaerobes that they are strict anaerobes in, and their strictness can be seen by the fact that if they are slightly exposed to oxygen they get killed so they 
definitely survive in those environments which are known as anoxic environments or those environments which are uh, lacking completely oxygen and they these environments they are rich in organic matter for example human and intestinal system of animals for example fresh water and marine sediments swamps and marshes hot springs deeper sides of hot springs and uh, anoxic or anaerobic uh, sludge digester and they can survive even within anaerobic protozoa so their oxygen requirements and they are very strict they do not need oxygen at all right they have several unusual cofactors definitely that's why they are unique in that sense that they are generating methane right their commercial importance or practical importance is very much high because methane can be used as a burning fuel and we are using the methane and uh, which is also known as a biogas and uh, sometimes uh, uh, the extent of this methane production is so much high that uh, the methane can gas can be bubbled on the surfaces of uh, uh, the places where these uh, methanogenic archaea they are present they can serve an excellent energy source secondly they are used for several years uh, in the treat sewage treatment plants so and the gas which is uh, produced by these organism can then be a source for heat and electricity so in so many villages it is also practically implied right that they installed a system for anaerobic digestion and they connect the gas with the supply of or they transform that gas as a source of uh, electricity and heat right so now moving towards halobacteria halobacteria as their name indicates they are aerobic chemohydrotrophs uh, which require at least 1.5 uh, molar nacl for growth so usually um, they they are disintegrated the cells they are they are not able to survive if the concentration is less than uh, 1.5 molar nacl right so it's it's mostly uh, you can say it's about 15% of the salt concentration in your ocean uh, so ocean salt is about 4% So you can just imagine that how much concentration of salt they require. So they mostly and they are present in um, those uh, salt lakes, oh, and salted fishes, and in those habitats like in Dead Sea, and where the concentration of salt is much higher than the normal or the routine ocean uh, waters, right? So they often uh, produce pigments. and these pigments and they use to protect them against uh, sunlight and one of that organism is very unique among halobacteria is that is the halobacterium salinarum halobacterium salinarum is unique in that sense that it can conduct photosynthetic reaction without using any pigment or any chlorophyll or any bacterial chlorophyll rather they generate a protein which is known as uh, bacterial rhodopsin and this protein can trap light uh, even without the presence of chlorophyll so this is a unique feature regarding halobacterium then we have uh, thermoplasma thermoplasmas um, they are those thermoplasms they are those 
archaea which lack cell wall and since they lack cell wall so and they they should have a membrane with some special features that enable them to survive in the in 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 the harsh environments because they are also grow uh, they also grow in the hot acidic coal refuse piles and they survive there so these piles they contain a large amount of iron pyrite and which is oxidized to sulfuric acid um, by some chemolithotrophic bacteria as a result the piles they become very hot and acidic so they are also one of the thermoacidophiles so uh, i just told you that it their plasma membrane should be very specialized so definitely they are strengthened the membranes are strengthened by large quantities of diglycerol tetraethers lipid containing polysaccharides and glycoprotein these all things they stabilize the membrane to ensure their survival in such harsh environments and uh, some of these strains they show very diverse property uh, like uh, thermoplasma one of the genus is thermoplasma it shows a different pattern of shape uh, at different temperatures like at higher temperatures it takes a, a form of irregular filament whereas lower temperature it becomes uh, spherical so you need to search the reason for it right what makes them uh makes them changing in their shapes at different temperatures right so another thermoplasm or another genus uh, is uh, picroplus so you can see that it is uh, it only grows below the ph 3.5 so above this ph it doesn't grow and even it can grow at ph 0 and optimally it grow at ph 0.7 so you can check uh, their ph requirements so the remarkable ph requirements and they have the picroplus genus picroplus then we have uh, the class uh, thermococci this again not much details are given but uh, they are again thermophilic uh, organisms cocci in shape and they can reduce sulfur to sulfide and then we have sulfur reducing archaea or uh, sulfate reducing archaea and they are placed in the class archaeoglobi and they differ from the other archaea because uh, uh they can use different electron donors to reduce sulfates and they also contain some important cofactors for methanogenesis so they can also generate methane uh, other than the methanogens right but they can reduce sulfate which is uh, by variety of electron donors so which is unique on their part right so this is all about the archaea so this archaea uh, the members of archaea they are economically they are very much important as you know that uh, you can use them as a source of hypo uh, you can use them as a source of enzymes that can show a great deal of thermostability and in fact you are using an enzyme uh, a polymerase enzyme uh, which is uh, uh, known as pfu uh, polymerase and in the in the pcr reactions and they can be a source of uh, i told you proteins and enzymes with great thermostability plus they can they are used they are important ecologically they are they, they can serve as a source excellent source of uh, biogas methane secondly they can recycle your waste material by serving you in anaerobic digesters 
plus uh, they can also play a role in the i must say greenhouse effect because the methane that is generated if it is not utilized is one of the greenhouse gas so there are a lot of ways in which archaea they are contributing in the planet earth right so with this i shall stop the i shall stop on this lecture if you have any question you can ask in the whatsapp group